is Mrs. Van Ferrari, and I'm going to read the next section of The One and Only Ivan. One day, after many weeks of loud talking, Helen packed a bag and slammed the front door and never came back. I don't know why. I never know the why of humans. That night, I slept with Mac in his bed. My old nests were woven of leaves and sticks and shaped like his bathtub, cool green cocoons. Mac's bed, like mine, was flat, hot, without sticks or stars. Still, he made a sleeping sound like the rumble my father used to make when all was well, a sound from deep inside his belly. Matt grew sullen. I grew bigger. I became what I was meant to be. Too large for chairs, too strong for hugs, too big for human life. I tried to stay calm, to move with dignity. I did my best to eat daintily, but human ways are hard to learn especially when you're not a human. When I saw my new dom domain, I was thrilled. And who wouldn't have been? It had no furniture to break, no glasses to smash, no, to <clears throat> no toilets to drop Mac's keys into. It even had a tire swing. I was relieved to have my own place. Somehow I didn't realize I'd be here quite so long. Now I drink Pepsi, eat old apples, watch reruns on TV. But many days I forget what I am supposed to be. Am I a human? Am I a gorilla? Humans have so many words, more than they truly need. Still, they have no name for what I am. Ruby is finally asleep. I watch her chest rise and fall. Bob, too, is snoring. But my mind is still racing. For perhaps the first time ever, I've been remembering. It's an odd story to remember, I have to admit. My story has a strange shape, a stunted beginning, an endless middle. I count all the days I've lived with humans. Gorillas count as well as anyone, although it's not a particularly useful skill to have in the wild. I've forgotten so many things, and yet I always know precisely how many days I've been in my domain. I take one of the magic markers Julia gave me. I make an X, a small one, on my painted jungle wall. I make more X's, and more. I make an X for every day of my life with humans. My mark looks like this. X, 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 X. The rest of the night, I mark the days, and when I am done, my wall looks like this. All those X's. And so on, until there are 9,876 X's marching across my wall like a parade of ugly insects. It's almost morning when I hear steps. It's Mac. He has a sharp smell. He weaves as he walks. He stands next to my domain. His eyes are red. He is staring out the window at the empty parking lot. Ivan, my man, he mumbles. Ivan. He presses his forehead against the glass. We've been through a lot, you and me. We don't see Mac for two days. When he returns, he doesn't talk about Stella. Mac says he is anxious to teach Ruby some tricks. He says the billboard is bringing in more visitors. He says it's time for a new beginning. All afternoon and into the evening, Mac works with Ruby. Ruby's feet are looped with rope so that she cannot run. A heavy chain hangs off her neck. Mac shows her Stella's ball, her pedestal, her stool. He introduces her to Snickers. When Ruby obeys Mac, he gives her a cube of sugar or a bit of dried apple. When she doesn't, he yells and kicks at the sawdust. When George and Julia arrive, Mac is still training Ruby. Julia sits on a bench and watches them. She draws a little, but mostly she keeps her eyes on Ruby. Bob watches too. He's hiding in the corner of my domain under Not Dead. It's raining outside, and Bob does not like damp feet. Ruby trudges behind Mac, her head drooping. Endlessly, they circle the ring. Sometimes Mac slaps her flank with his hand. Suddenly, Ruby jerks to a stop. Mac pulls the chain hard, but Ruby refuses to move. Come on, Ruby. Mac is almost pleading. What is your problem? She's exhausted, I say to myself. That's the problem. Mac groans. Idiot elephant. Idiot human, Bob mutters. Walk, Ruby, I say, although I know she's too far away to hear me. Do what he says. 
Walk, Matt commands, now. Ruby doesn't walk. She plops her rump on the sawdust floor. I think maybe she's tired, Julia says. Mac wipes his forehead with the back of his arm. Yeah, I know. We're all tired. He pushes Ruby with the heel of his boot. She ignores him. George looks over from the food court where he is wiping off tables. Mac, he yells. Maybe you should call it a day. I'll close up. Mac yanks on Ruby's chain. She's as anchored as a tree trunk. He pulls harder and falls to his knees. That does it, Mac says. He brushes sawdust off his jeans. I'm through playing around. Mac stomps off to his office. When he returns, he is carrying a long stick. The gleaming hook on its end is almost beautiful like the sliver of moon. It's a claw stick. Mac pokes Ruby with a sharp point. Not hard, just a touch. I can tell he wants her to see how much it can hurt. I growl low in my throat. Ruby doesn't budge. She is a gray, unmoving boulder. She closes her eyes, and for a moment, I wonder if she might have fallen asleep. I'm warning you, Mac says. He breathes out. He stares at the ceiling. Ruby makes a huffing sound. Fine, Mac says. You want to play it that way? He draws back the claw stick. No, Julia cries. I'm not going to hurt her, Mac says. I just want to get her attention. Bob snarls. Mac swings. The hook slices the air just a few inches above Ruby's head. See why you don't want to mess with me, Mac says. He draws back the claw stick again. Now move! Ruby jerks her head, flinging her trunk toward Mac. She makes a noise that sends the sawdust scattering. It makes my glass shiver. It is the most beautiful mad I have ever heard. Ruby's trunk slaps into Mac. I don't see exactly where she strikes him. Somewhere below his stomach, I think. And I know he must be uncomfortable because Mac drops the claw stick and falls down on the ground and curls into a ball and howls like a baby. Direct hit, Bob says. Mac groans. He stumbles to his feet and hobbles off toward his office. Ruby watches him leave. I can't read her expression. Is she afraid? Relieved? Proud? When Mac is gone, George and Julia leave Ruby from the ring. It's okay, baby. It's okay, Julia says, stroking Ruby's head. They settle Ruby in her domain and make sure she has fresh water and food. Before long, Ruby's dozing. Dad? Julia asks as George locks Ruby's iron door. Do you think Mac would ever hurt Ruby? I don't think so, Jules, George says. At least I hope not. Maybe we could call someone. George scratches his chin. I wish I could help Ruby, but I wouldn't know how. I mean, who would I call? The elephant cops? Besides, George looks down. I need this job, Jules. We need this job. Your mom, the doctor bills. He kisses the top of Julia's head. Back to work, you and me both. Julia sighs and reaches for her backpack. She removes a piece of paper, a bottle of water, and a small metal box. Homework first, George says, wagging a finger. Then you can paint. It's for art class, Julia explains. We're doing watercolors. I'm going to paint Ruby. George smiles. All right, then. Just don't forget your spelling. Dan, Julia asks again. Did you see Mac's face when Ruby hit him? George nods. Yes, he says solemnly. I did. He shakes his head. Poor Mac. He turns away, and only then do I hear him laughing. Julia opens the metal box. I see a row of little squares. Green, blue, red, black, yellow, purple, orange. The colors seem to glow. She pulls out a brush with a thin tuft of a tail at its end. She dips the brush in water and wets the paper, then taps at the red square. When the brush meets the damp paper, pink petals of color unfurl like morning flowers. I can't take my eyes off that magical brush. For a moment, I'm not thinking about Ruby and Mac and the claw stick and Stella. Almost. Julia touches red again, then blue, and there, suddenly, it's the purple of a ripe grape. 
She touches the blue and her paper turns to summer sky. Black and white, and now I see that she is painting a picture of Ruby. I can make out her floppy ears, her thick legs. Julia stops painting. She takes a few steps back, hands on her hips, gazing at her work. She scowls. It's not right, she says. She glances over her shoulder at me. I try to look encouraging. Julia starts to crumple up the paper, then reconsiders. Instead, she slides it into my cage at the spot where my glass is broken. Here you go, she says. A Julia original. That'll be worth millions someday. Gingerly, I pick up, pick up the paper. I do not eat a single bite of it. Oh, hey, I almost forgot, Julia runs to her backpack. She pulls out three plastic jars, one yellow, one blue, one red. She opens the jars and an odd, not food smell hits my nose. Julia pushes the jars one by one through the opening. Then she slides some paper through. These are called finger paints, she says. My aunt gave them to me, but really, I'm too old for finger painting. I stick a finger into the red jar. The paint is thick as mud. It's cool and smooth like bananas, bananas underfoot. I pop my finger into my mouth. It's not exactly ripe mango, but it's not bad. Julia laughs. You don't eat it, you paint with it. She grabs a piece of paper and presses her finger on it. See, like this. I place my finger on a piece of paper, I lift it, and a red mark is there. I get a bigger glob from the pot and slap my hand down on the page. When I pull my hand off the paper, its red twin stays behind. This isn't like the ghostly handprints on my glass, the ones my visitors leave behind. This handprint can't, can't be so easily wiped away.